You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Bring your local veterinarian a sick dog or cat, and they'll adroitly determine what's ailing it. Bring them a guinea pig, hamster, bird, or fish that, oh, just isn't right, and they'll likely be flummoxed. Though veterinarians are trained to care for all species, the nuances of tending to the general well-being of small mammals, birds, reptiles, and fish is a very focused subspecialty of pet care. What can an owner of one of these unique pets do to keep them healthy? What are some of the common emergencies to which they're prone, and what can they do to prevent them? My guest will answer these questions. She is a diplomate at the American College of Zoological Medicine. This is a title held by less than 200 veterinarians in the entire world. My guest, Olivia Petrich, has the distinction of being one of two in this elite assemblage to hold a subspecialty in zoological companion animals. We'll be right back after this short break with this really unique special guest. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Swipe It's a revolutionary new product that literally swipes away cat hair from virtually any surface. You know, most of us struggle with a roller or vacuum cleaner to clean up cat hair, but anyone who has tried either of these knows they just don't work very well. But Swipe It's patent pending glove has a magnetic-like quality that removes cat hair from almost everything. And best of all, Swipe It's is machine washable, so you can use it over and over again. To order, just visit SwipeIt's.com. That's S-W-I-P-E-T Yes, a simple solution for shedding. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Olivia, you are what every little veterinarian growing up has wanted to be, a zoological veterinarian working at zoos and working with exotic animals. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So how did you get in this very unique field? It's a good question. So I I always was interested in animals and interested in being a veterinarian. And my first job was as a zookeeper. And I didn't really have a whole lot of exotic pets growing up. I had some guinea pigs, but that really just kind of opened my eyes to what was out there. And I was just amazed at our veterinarian at the zoo that, you know, was able to in one minute see a monkey and the next minute take care of a bird. And so I just thought that was fascinating. So that's kind of the idea that I had when I went to vet school, that this is what I wanted to do. And you went to Purdue. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And then where did you go from there? Yeah, so I did uh, a couple of one-year internships, which is pretty much the norm for people that want to go into zoo medicine because it does require a a residency. So the first two internships, one was with just uh, dogs and cats doing emergency and some specialty work in San Diego. The second one was a exotic pet internship in Houston, Texas. And um, that did have some zoo work as well. And then I had the privilege to go to UC Davis for my residency. And ooh, that, ooh, um, ooh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I knew I'd get that in there. Yeah, right. And there I worked with exotic pets and did some rotations at several different zoos and aquaria and the Marine Mammal Center. And so it was a, a really diverse residency program and um, kind of got me to where I am today. 
That is awesome because I know I also had a, a major interest in zoological medicine and was fortunate in between my junior and senior year at UC Davis to work at the Los Angeles Zoo. And you're right, every day was just something so exciting, something so different. And working on a giraffe is kind of like a cow and working on other animals are somewhat like cats and dogs. But here you are, very specialized, one of two in the world. So you are something that most, you know, a veterinarian that most pet owners with exotics can't access. You're here in Los Angeles area. What would somebody do if they say, you know, I have a, I think it's a sick guinea pig. I'm not sure. How do they find a veterinarian to take care of that guinea pig? Right. And that's that's one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, for exotic pet owners that, you know, they get the pet either from a pet store or from a friend or for a breeder. And, you know, a veterinarian that treats those is, is a little bit more challenging to find than a dog or cat. So I commonly have people that either word of mouth or on the internet or, you know, looking at calling their dog and cat veterinarian. And then, you know, they kind of pass the word along and then they eventually end up with me. And one of the great things about veterinarians is I think most of them aren't ashamed to say, you know, I really don't know. I'm going to do some research or let me go ahead and call Dr. Olivia and find out what she has to say about X condition. Because I think we're always consulting with each other, too, whether or not it's a, a cat, a dog, a horse or a giraffe. Exactly. And I, I've been really impressed with the veterinarians in this area. They're a great group of people and um, have been able to, to work with several already. I've only been here a, a short time, but, but yeah, it's, it's been a, a good community to work with. So exactly what is an exotic animal? People might think that a, a Bengal cat is an exotic, which it, it is, but not exactly what I think what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I guess I, I consider an exotic pet anything but a dog, cat, and maybe some of the more common farm animals such as cows and horses. Although some people have farm animals that are considered exotic pets such as chickens or geese and then of course the pot-bellied pig. So I do treat those, but um, the larger ones, I don't believe a horse would fit in our door. So I don't think I can <laughs> And probably some of those pot belly pigs aren't going to fit too well either. Yeah, yep, exactly. <laughs> I was looking down at uh, some of the various little creatures that you treat. And here in California, and I know other parts of the United States, they are totally legal. But there are times people will bring in, oh, we call them funny cats. And the funny cat actually is a ferret. If you could address, number one, why California has made ferrets illegal and why ferrets really aren't little cats. Exactly. So ferrets are illegal in in all of California, although we are legally, as a veterinarian, able to treat them and to hospitalize them. We aren't allowed to keep them for boarding and for that sort of thing, but we are legally allowed to treat them. And uh, the thought of why they're illegal is that they pose a, a threat if released and starting a breeding colony in the wild, that they would be harmful to the native wildlife. So that is the, the main reason why they are illegal in California. And there are you know several other places as well. But veterinarians in California are legally allowed to treat them. There are several other exotic pets, such as African pygmy hedgehogs and several bird species, prairie dogs, um, and then a lot of the, the larger zoo species that are also illegal as pets. And what's fascinating is I would say 99% of the funny cats that uh, I have ever seen have come in from Nevada and they're already descented because they do have a very unique scent to them and they're already neutered. So as such, we really don't have to worry about it, but maybe someday that law will change. You were mentioning some of these various species and people, and I was just reading someplace where there was two small tiger cubs that were confiscated by fishing game. And I'm sorry, I don't remember what particular state. What is your opinion about people wanting to keep some of these large, potentially dangerous cats? Yeah, I think that's also a good question and a a challenging one because I do have an ethical dilemma with keeping them, especially because a lot of these animals are endangered in the wild. 
There's actually a statistic out there that there are more tigers in Texas than there are in the wild. Oh, my goodness. It's just sad. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. And I think these animals are challenging to house, you know, just with the, the structure that is needed, the amount of food that's required, and then the risk that they pose. So I think there's been numerous reports, including, you know, that very unfortunate incident in Ohio where all those animals got out. And, um, you know, ultimately, it, it usually does not bode well for the animal. So I think for safety reasons and for ethical reasons, you know, I I do not believe they're good um, to have as pets. And I think there's a lot of other options, you know, not just with dogs and cats, but other species, some of the ones that I see that may be more appropriate to have. I know people are always concerned about zoos and animals being displayed, and they've done such a good job of trying to improve their environment, improve their mental status. Some zoos being better than others, but sometimes this is the only way people will get an appreciation for what this gorgeous creature looks like in the wild and hopefully increase their awareness that it's so necessary to protect their wild environment because no cage can ever be big enough for an animal. Exactly. And I think that's what the new thinking or newer thinking for a lot of zoos is they're trying to promote the the conservation message and, you know, get children involved at a young age and get them used to what a tiger looks like and then also educate them as to why they're having troubles in the wild and what they can do to help and prevent that. So I think that's the message now that most zoos are are trying to give is, is a conservation message rather than a display for your entertainment. Type message. With regard to some of the little creatures that we're more likely to have at home and seem to do well with uh, being kept in our homes and our backyards, let's go back to ferrets again. What are some of the common problems that people see with ferrets? Yeah, I think that's a, a good question. There are several diseases that are really common in ferrets in the United States specifically. There's also what I refer to and other veterinarians as well as the big three of ferret diseases, and that includes adrenal disease, insulinoma, and lymphoma. And none of those are good. Yeah, unfortunately. Some of them can be managed, both medically and surgically. Of those diseases, insulinoma is probably the number one that could lead to a trip to the emergency room for affected ferrets. So it is important for owners to be aware of that disease and and some of the signs to look for. So insulinoma, they're hearing this going, hmm, that sounds like insulin. Are they getting into a bottle of insulin? No, their body's overproducing insulin. So what would they be seeing? So essentially, this is a a tumor of the pancreas. So it's the opposite of diabetes, so that animals have too much insulin, so their blood sugar is very low. So some signs that an owner might see would include their ferret that's usually pretty active and, you know, doing normal ferret things, getting into things and being naughty. So their ferret maybe is more lethargic or weak. And also a specific sign that um, isn't really noted in, in dogs with insulinoma is that ferrets tend to get nauseous. So they'll salivate a lot and they might paw at their mouth. And ultimately, if it goes on for a period of time untreated, uh, can lead to seizures and even death of the ferret. So if any owners see those signs, it's really important that they bring them to a, a veterinarian. And often, you know, that's on emergency. And treatment for it? Yeah, so there are several medical and surgical treatment options. There are some medications that can be prescribed to help basically treat the symptoms. It doesn't make the tumor go away. And then ultimately, there are surgical options such as removing the tumor that can help treat it. You'd mentioned then adrenal issues. So people go adrenal, it kind of sounds like adrenaline. So adrenaline being a hormone that's given off. And when we get frightened, all of a sudden we have that adrenaline rush and we want to just fight or flight. What do we see with a ferret with this adrenal issue? So that one, not as common to see on emergency, and it's usually a gradual onset, and the most common sign that you would see, an owner of a ferret would see, is hair loss. So adrenal disease in ferrets is very different than adrenal disease, I guess the other species you'd see it most common in is a dog, and sometimes in dogs it's called Cushing's disease, and it's basically affects in ferrets a different part of the adrenal gland. So in ferrets, they actually have an excessive amount of sex steroid hormones. So you get essentially male pattern baldness, 
but in print. <laughs> you have a um, very sexy ferret. Right, exactly. So it can lead to problems because in addition to the hair loss, you can also see swelling of the vulva if it's a female ferret or enlargement of the prostate, which makes it difficult for male ferrets to urinate. So that can ultimately lead to a urinary obstruction if not treated. Wow. Dr. Olivia Petrich, this has been some really interesting information. So we've kind of talked about ferrets. People have a lot of them throughout the United States. Bunnies. Easter is one of those times people like to get bunnies. I know I did as a child. Not a real good idea to do. But big bunnies, little bunnies. But bunnies are not as easy to take care of as people might think. What are some of the common problems with bunnies? So the most common reason I see rabbits uh, is for not eating or and or not defecating. And often owners will refer to this as GI stasis, and it should be considered an emergency. In fact, any rabbit with a decreased appetite or one that's not really eating anything at all for uh, 6, even 12 hours should be brought to a veterinarian as soon as possible. And that's mainly that's a very short amount of time. It is, yeah, yeah, much different than than a dog or a cat, and that's because their GI tract is very different. So they are, in fact, more like a horse than they are like a dog or a cat because they are strict herbivores. So if their GI tract is not functioning, they can get really sick really quickly. The other difference is that they cannot vomit. So if they have an obstruction, all of that fluid and food just kind of builds up in their GI tract, and that can be a uh, surgical emergency. So it is something that owners of rabbits should be aware of and, and watch them closely each day to make sure that they are still eating and defecating. I'm talking right now with Dr. Olivia Petrich. She is a board-certified veterinary zoological companion animal veterinarian, a very elite group, only two in the entire world. Talking about exotic pets, we're going to come back right now, talk about two pets that she has at home, a Rottweiler and a guinea pig that share a potential common GI problem, actually something that you may have heard about in your own dog. We'll be right back after this short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Every pet is unique. Maybe they're gray in the muzzle, yet young at heart. Maybe they're growing out of the puppy stage and into their paws and ears. Or maybe they're just trying to maintain a more girlish figure. At PetSmart, we have the right food for your pet at a great value for you. PetSmart. Be better together. Go to PetSmartDeal.com and save up to 30% on awesome gifts for the pets and pet people in your life. Toys, collars, leashes, PetSmart gift cards, treats, and more. Go to PetSmartDeal.com today. P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Robin Gansert, President and CEO of American Humane Association, the country's first national humane organization, here to tell you about our new show, Be Humane, on Pet Life Radio. Each week, we'll be bringing you the latest news and issues affecting our animal friends, and we'll also be bringing you interviews with Hollywood's biggest animal advocates, here to share tales about their pets and what they're doing to promote a more humane world. Our own highly experienced staff and friends of the organization will also join us each week to share what they're up to in the animal world. I hope you'll stop by. Until then, let's always remember to be humane. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Olivia, I was noticing your picture and you have this gorgeous guinea pig with you. Is that your own Coco? That is, yep, that is Coco. Actually, her full name is Coco Chanel. (laughs) 
Ah, uh, no wonder she looks so gorgeous. Yes, very beautiful. And yes, so I have her and I also have a dog. He's a, a Rottweiler mix named Luke. And a kitty named Sally, so Sally and the guinea pig must get along fairly well. They do. Yep, they do. But what I was alluding to before the break was the fact that guinea pigs and Rottweilers can both get GI vulvule, so torsion of their stomach. And I have to admit, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's been a couple of reports here recently that, you know, we were always aware as a veterinary community that guinea pigs, just like rabbits, they have a very similar GI tract, can become bloated because as rabbits uh, cannot vomit, so can rodents. Rodents also cannot vomit. So if they have an obstruction or even a functional obstruction, so if they have just a bunch of hay um, in their stomach, it will become bloated, which that in and of itself can be an issue. But um, recently, again, there were several reports, and I've seen a couple of cases of this, where not only did the stomach become very distended and bloated, but it also can twist on itself, which is, as you would know in in a dog, called the GDV, or gastric dilatation volvulus, where the stomach not only becomes bloated, but then twists, um, and that is definitely a surgical emergency. Is there anything that can be done to try to prevent this from occurring? Is the type of feed, how much you feed them, or is it just bad luck? Yeah, so I think the the diet is very important for both rodents, um, specifically for guinea pigs and chinchillas, very similar GI tracts, um, as well as rabbits. So they need hay. They need that long-stemmed hay that will help with their GI tract, so that helps stimulate it to move. Certainly pellets are okay to be given in in small amounts, and in fact, guinea pigs, uh, another fun fact, they also cannot produce vitamin C. So just like primates and people, they are not able to make their own vitamin C, so they need that in their diet. And there are a lot of different vegetables and fruits and greens that have vitamin C, but their pellets also have vitamin C. So in guinea pigs, it is important that they have a source of that. And of course, greens are are always good to to feed to these herbivorous creatures as well. But hay is, is a very important part of their diet and will help prevent issues such as bloating, etc. But um, if they have an underlying condition, if they have teeth problems, etc., then they can still develop that. Speaking of teeth, going back a little bit into rabbits, many people don't realize, and you say, boy, this rabbit is so bad. It's always chewing on wood, and it's chewing on the wood in its hutch, and if I let it out of its cage, and it's running around the house, it's chewing on the legs of the furniture. Rabbits really do need to do this, don't they? Exactly. Yeah. So rabbits and certain rodents, such as guinea pigs and chinchillas, have continuously growing teeth. So both their incisors and then their cheek teeth, so the premolars and molars in the back of their mouth, grow constantly. In fact, several millimeters per week. So they need to have something such as hay to help keep those teeth at a normal level. Um, So if they don't have enough in their diet, then sometimes they look elsewhere, such as on, you know, the edges of furniture and (laughs) things that they shouldn't be chewing on. All right. Segue of chewing. I have to admit, I live in a condo, three cats. I let my cats out in the backyard. Very good. They just stay in their little backyard. They don't go anywhere. But every once in a while, a bird flies into the yard, and there have been instances where my cats have said, look, Mommy, I love you, and they bring me a present of a bird that they've caught, thankfully still alive. Some of them have survived, some haven't. Somebody has a cat that brings them a bird. Can they just say, oh, it's all right, or how much of an emergency is that cat bite to a bird? So it it definitely is considered an emergency, even if it doesn't look like there is any wound. So even on larger animals, let's say a cat bites another cat, bite wounds are very difficult to detect as their canines are really thin. So often you won't even see a wound, unlike a, a dog bite wound. And birds in general are very sensitive to the bacteria present in cats' mouths. And if left untreated, um, it can be fatal to birds within a very short time period, as soon as 48 hours of a bite. So it's really important to bring any bird, whether it's a pet bird or a wild bird that has been in contact with a cat. And by 
contact, I mean, just playing with it, even if, you know, you don't witness an actual bite, they should be brought to a veterinarian immediately if possible for a complete physical and then certainly antibiotics if needed. Dr. Olivia Petrich, who is with Access Specialty Animal Hospitals in Los Angeles, birds. There are times some of us maybe aren't the best cooks in the world. So you're cooking up something, you have a parakeet, it's in the cage, you keep it close to the kitchen, and all of a sudden you're cooking up some eggs in the morning in your Teflon pan, and you get distracted, you burn it, and you come home from work, and your bird is dead. Oh my goodness, where did that come from? Birds are are very interesting and their respiratory tract is very different than mammals. Um, So there's a couple different anatomic things that they have that are different, but specifically, they're actually much better at extracting oxygen from the environment than a mammal, and therefore, they're also better at extracting toxins. So things that wouldn't be toxic to us, let's say scented candles, incense, or a burnt pan can be fatal to them. And I always use for for my owners the analogy of the canary that goes down in the coal mines, or at least did, with the miners. And the reason was that they would become sick way before the miners would even realize that there was carbon monoxide or some other toxic fume. So they would act as, you know, kind of an alert system before we had electronic systems to prevent that. So any smoke, even cigarette smoke, birds are very sensitive to, and Teflon also, and it has to get to a a pretty high heat. So it's usually when, you know, you forget and leave a non-stick pan that contains Teflon on the stove and it burns. And then that smoke can be very toxic to birds. So definitely a good idea to keep your bird, um, if you have one, keep its cage or um, its perch or wherever it lives away from the kitchen just in case. And then certainly if there is smoke or heaven forbid a fire or anything like that, that your bird is removed from that environment as soon as possible. Another bird item that comes up, and in my area, thankfully, I have several veterinarians who have a great interest in birds and small reptiles, etc., but birds with egg bindings. So we know that you don't have to have a boy and a girl bird together in order to have them lay eggs. And at certain times of year, they just keep prolifically laying eggs and laying eggs and they can become weak, the egg can get stuck, egg binding. Talk to us a little bit about egg binding and this egg production. Yeah, so just like a a dog or cat that can have problems giving birth, which sometimes we call dystocia, birds can also have problems laying eggs, and that's if it is an egg that is stuck, is usually called egg binding. There are a number of causes for that, and ultimately can prove fatal for the bird if it's not treated promptly. So some signs that an owner can watch for, especially if they know that their bird is female or has a history of laying eggs, would be just some general things like decreased appetite, if they're fluffed, so if their feathers are all fluffed up, if they're sitting at the bottom of the cage, or sometimes you'll often see them straining, um, like straining to defecate. You also may notice that the bird's abdomen is distended, or you may even see the tip of the egg protruding through the bird's vent. So if any of those signs are seen, it's really important that your bird is seen by a veterinarian who sees birds, so an avian veterinarian, as soon as possible. Sometimes we're able to palpate the egg, but it is always important to take an x-ray to determine, you know, is this egg not able to pass because it's just a big egg or perhaps it's broken or I've seen several instances where there's actually two eggs, which is never normal. And then, you know, we can also check to see if there is a reason, not a structural reason, but more of a medical reason why they can't lay eggs. And a pretty common reason is that their calcium is too low. So calcium is required just as it is in mammals for muscle contraction. And often some of these birds, especially like the little cockatiels that just lay eggs and lay eggs and lay eggs, their calcium can be depleted, um, especially if they don't have a good diet. So if they have an all-seed diet, seeds are really low in calcium and other vitamins and minerals, and they may not just physically be able to lay the egg because their muscles are not contracting properly. So cuddle bones, one way of getting them extra calcium? 
Exactly. Yep. So you can give them a cuddle bone, which is a pretty high in calcium carbonate. Um, and the best diet to feed them is a, a pellet-based diet. So there are several brands out there now, such as Rowdy Bush and Zoo Cream and several others. And, and they're in a, a lot of the more common pet stores as well. And that is the ideal diet that they should be on because it's balanced nutritionally and has all the appropriate vitamins and minerals that are needed for birds. In your experience, what have been maybe one of the hardest exotic, unique pets for a pet owner to try and maintain? I know there's sugar gliders out there, there's various birds and reptiles, people keep spiders also, but what have you found is one of the hardest pets to keep in a home situation? So I think some of the the more challenging species are reptiles, and that's just because the number of different components that are important for their well-being that you you would never think of for a dog or a cat or even a bird or a rabbit. So a lot of these species are tropical species, such as rainbow boas or iguanas that are used to and need 60 to 70 percent humidity, which is, you know, very difficult. In Southern California, where it's pretty dry most of the year, and you know, so not only do they need humidity, they need the appropriate temperature, and not just the temperature, but a range of temperatures. So therefore, you need to provide lights and heat. Um, they need UVB light, which is something that ideally, you know, they'd get from natural direct sunlight. But if they're kept inside, then they need a specific wavelength of UVB light so they can metabolize their calcium appropriately. They also, most of them, um, will require a either insect-based diet or a specialized diet that, again, needs supplementation and monitoring. And so it's, it's very different than, you know, let's say a dog that, you know, you have a, a pelleted diet, they need to go outside for walks and need interaction, but, you know, you don't need to measure their temperature of their cage or the humidity or make sure they have lights. And so I think reptiles are very awesome to have as pets, and I, I'm not discouraging them, but I just think they they do require a lot more knowledge and, and a lot more care than, you know, than one might think. Dr. Livy, you bring up something really good about care. These exotics seem to be many times much more adroit at hiding their signs of illness. People will bring in the guinea pig, bring in the bird, bring in the reptile. That really, Doc, it just was fine last week and now it's on, you know, it's last scale, last paw, last wing, whatever. And it's like, but I had no idea that it was sick. They seem to hide their signs of illness until that last moment. So I'll always tell people, do your homework and take that pet, even though it seems healthy, to your veterinarian at least yearly for a good wellness check. Would you agree with that? I would definitely. And I think the main reason that, you know, that people, and I believe them when they say that, I don't think they're, you know, not taking good care of their pets. But I think a lot of the species that I see, mainly small mammals, rabbits, rodents, and birds, are prey species. So as a group, they tend to hide their signs of illness, much as their ancestors had to do to prevent being eaten by a predator. So by the time the owner notices the problem, the disease is often very advanced, uh, more so than perhaps a dog or a cat, which makes it even more challenging for, you know, us exotic veterinarians to return them back to health. So it's really important for owners to recognize that even the slightest abnormality, so such as a rabbit that doesn't really want to take its favorite treat or, hmm, you know, its litter box, it doesn't look like it's defecated all day. You know, those are some more subtle signs that um, may be indicative of a problem. And you also bring up a very good point about the wellness exam. So, you know, I think we're getting over that stereotype of dogs and cats that, oh, they need to be brought to the vet for vaccines. Well, a lot of the species I see don't need to be vaccinated, but still very important to bring them in for wellness checks, just like a dog or a cat, just to make sure that we catch something potentially harmful earlier. And it's a great way, I think, for pet owners to become 
educate it. If you have a question, ask your veterinarian instead of maybe somebody at the pet store who may not be as advanced in their knowledge of particular subjects. You might be able to pick up some little tidbits on husbandry and nutrition, just ways to prevent it because so many times people go, but, you know, why should I take it in? This little creature cost me, you know, a rat, cost me fourteen ninety five at the pet store and the office call is going to be two or three times that amount of money to take it in. You know, that's crazy. But they're not disposable creatures. They are now something that you've taken into your home and you're responsible for. Exactly. I do come across, you know, some that with owners that, you know, they they bring up their monetary value. And and to me, they're all invaluable. You know, to me, they're even a tarantula or a frog. I treat the exact same way as I would treat a dog or a kinkajou or a sugar glider. They're all equally as important to me. And, you know, I think that is when you decide to get a pet, that's now a member of your family. And it does cost money to to take care of them and to bring them to the veterinarian, but that's certainly something to consider, you know, before buying any pet, regardless of the species. Dr. Olivia, you mentioned tarantulas. We touched a little bit about reptiles. I definitely am going to have to have you back on the show because we could do a whole show on kinkajous, rabbits, reptiles. So you are definitely going to be back on the show. So listeners, we have been listening today to Dr. Olivia Petrick. She is with Axis Specialty Animal Hospitals in Los Angeles. Again, one of two veterinarians in the entire world with a subspecialty in zoological companion animals. That's why she's so smart. So thank you very much for listening today. We'll be back again next week having more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. If you have any questions about your particular pet, you want me to cover a topic, please contact us at the Pet Doctor at Pet Life Radio and I'll try to get that on the air with you. Take care. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>